Are you ready to do some more abstract group theory? I mean, like really abstract? We'll continue doing very abstract things that seem like it's abstract nonsense, but it really does have meaning. And it's worth your while to think about, to wrestle with. So let's work on that now. So again, last time we talked about how ought G was a group. Well, this time, let's talk about how ought G is sometimes called an invariant of group isomorphisms. And what does that mean? That means, here's a, here's a claim, if G is isomorphic to G bar, if those are two groups that are isomorphic to each other, that implies that the group ought G and the group ought of G bar, which certainly will exist because G and G bar are isomorphic, are groups I hope it makes some intuitive sense that these, these would be isomorphic as well. Ought G preserves isomorphic groups, you might say. In category theory, you would call ought a functor. Did I say that right? Yes, I said functor. I didn't say function. I said functor. A functor. What? Mm. It's, it's essentially a function that takes a group as an input and gives a group as an output. And that's such a weird kind of function that they give it a new name called a functor. And in category theory, this generalizes there are, there are lots of, functor is an abstract concept in the theory, in the theory of categories, that's abstract nonsense. It's a fun term, by the way, abstract nonsense. We, we, we use these words because we're trying to humor ourselves, right? Um, there are lots of other functors in algebra, in topology, and, and things like that. How in the world would you go about proving this claim, and would I ask you to prove it on the test? Well, not fully, but may, you should understand it enough to maybe do a partial proof of it, things that I talk about here. But well, how in the world do you start? G is isomorphic to G bar. How do you prove that ought of G is isomorphic to ought of G bar? Hmm. <clears throat> All we've got are, are abstract ideas here. Groups and isomorphisms. G is isomorphic to G bar. I guess that means there's got to be an isomorphism from G to G bar. What should I call it? Oh, I don't know. How about phi? <laughs> so I know since I'm given that G is isomorphic to G bar, I know, we know, an isomorphism exists. We don't know what it is, isomorphism, because we don't know what G and G bar are. We don't know a formula for it, we just know it exists. We know there's a one-to-one -one and onto function from G to G bar that's also operation preserving. And what's our goal? Our goal is to show ought of G is isomorphic to ought of G bar. Our goal is to, I guess, come up with an isomorphism then from ought of G to ought of G bar. What should I call that? How about another Greek letter? How about psi? Isn't psi pretty? Psi. Nobody's a physics double major in here, right? Okay, sometimes we have math and physics double majors, and whenever they see psi, they think quantum mechanics. They think wave function from quantum mechanics, but... Okay, nobody is a physicist in here. So psi is going to be our isomorphism that we hope to ex show exists. We hope to show this isomorph... And, well, that's the way, wrong way to phrase it. Show an isomorphism exists. We don't know it exists ahead of time. We're trying to prove it exists. But this begs a question. How do you figure out what it is? This is the kind of thing that just like you look at it, stare at it for like an hour, oh, go get some coffee, stare at it for another hour. I have no idea what to do. How do I take an arbitrary element of ought of G and map it to an element of ought of G bar? 
how in the world would you do such a thing? Oh, one, one bright idea that should come into your mind, a light bulb that should go off eventually, hopefully, is that, oh, I must have to use phi somehow. That, that's got to be relevant, right? There's an isomorphism. I mean, if G and G bar were not isomorphic, there would not be an isomorphism. So it must be relevant. So then there's a question of how to use phi, but, phi, but then you stare at it for a while and go get some coffee and maybe go take a nap. Come back, uh, stare at it some more. It's still there. It hasn't gone away. What do you do? Okay, draw more pictures. And that's, by the way, what category theory is all about, is a bunch of pictures. If you look it up on Wikipedia, it's a bunch of diagrams with, well, the, the diagrams could include groups, and it could also include a bunch of arrows that might represent isomorphisms all over the place. Um, okay. So what do we got here? How do we take an arbitrary element of odd of G? What's an element of odd of G? It's an isomorphism from G to itself. Maybe I should do this. G and an arrow going back to itself. You can see these things in graph theory, right? Um, maybe that's an automorphism of G. What should I call it? Um, maybe I should avoid phi. How about alpha? So there is an arbitrary, in my mind, an arbitrary element of odd of G. What's an arbitrary element of odd of G bar? It would be an isomorphism from G bar to itself. Hmm. How could I create such an isomorphism? Well, I could. Here's the key insight. I could think about also the fact that I've got phi in this picture. What's a natural way to take this diagram and create a function that starts at G bar and goes back to G bar eventually using alpha? And I guess using phi. How about go backwards? Apply phi inverse, go from right to left. It exists because phi is one to one and onto. And we, we've talked about this, phi inverse would be an isomorphism. It would be operation preserving. Then apply alpha then go back to G bar with phi. That's a natural thing to associate alpha with, a natural thing to map alpha to in odd of G bar. Remember with function composition, work from right to left, phi inverse gets done first, then alpha, then phi. Maybe that's psi. Right idea. Maybe psi of alpha should be phi alpha phi inverse. <laughs> kind of looks like an inner automorphism, doesn't it? We talked this little side comment. We talked about inner automorphisms on Monday. With this kind of formula, similar kind of formula, right? I mean, it's different what's going on here. Here, with inner automorphisms of a group G, X and A were elements of G, and this was an automorphism from G to itself, induced by A, it's called. Um, similar kind of formula here, except the objects that I'm thinking about here, the alpha and the phi, are not elements of G in the ordinary sense. They are functions, although alpha is in a group. Alpha itself is in out of G. Psi, or uh, phi, is not necessarily seemingly in a group. It's an isomorphism. Could it be an element of some group? Possibly, but we're not really thinking about such a thing. So while it's similar to inner automorphisms in the formula, it's a different setting. Again, arbitrary person off the street looks at a bunch of this and says, hey, that's abstract nonsense. And a mathematician agrees. Yes, it is abstract nonsense. But it's abstract nonsense that does have meaning, an important meaning, actually, in group theory. This, this is an important fact, and, I, and it... And it should be intuitive that you would want it to be true, you would hope it would be true. 
And in fact, here's, an, here's a real important point about it. Since this implication is true up here, this claim, its contrapositive is also true because contrapositives are equivalent. But what would the contrapositive say? The contrapositive would say that if ought G and ought of G bar are not isomorphic, then G and G bar would also not be isomorphic. That sounds useful. Trying to decide if two groups are isomorphic, or maybe you suspect they're not isomorphic, maybe it's easier to prove their groups of automorphisms are not isomorphic. Maybe that's easier. Maybe. Maybe, maybe not. But if you can do that, then you've proved G and G bar are not isomorphic. The contrapositive, if this claim is true, it's contrapositive is true, and, and, and they are both true, I'm telling you. Yeah, this psi is going to be the isomorphism we seek. What's left to do? What's left to do is to show it's one to one onto an operation preserver. One to one. Suppose psi of alpha equals psi of beta, <clears throat> where alpha and beta are assumed to be both in odd G. These are both in odd G. <clears throat> well, I guess there is one more thing to emphasize before I do this. Is this function here truly in odd of G bar? It certainly maps G bar to itself. You can see from the diagram, the inverse goes this way. You're applying it first, then you're applying alpha, then you're applying phi. It certainly maps G bar to itself. Is it one to one onto an operation preserving? Certainly it's one to one and onto, because you're composing one to one and onto functions. Is it operation preserving? That technically takes proof, but the proof is no harder, maybe even easier than the proof that the inverse was operation preserving. Do a little side calculation here. Um, is this composition operation preserving? I'm assuming all these functions individually are operation preserving. So you would do this as your first step. Lots of parentheses. Then you do this as your second step. Wow. Lots of abstract nonsense, seemingly, because of so many parentheses. Ah, am I going to run out of room? Ah. Easy to make a mistake. We got one more step to do. We got to use the phi as operation preserving as well. Yeah. Hopefully, I'm not making a mistake here. It's too many parentheses. I didn't give myself enough room. That does it. Right? Phi. Compose alpha compose phi inverse of that is phi compose alpha compose phi inverse of the first thing times phi compose alpha compose alpha inverse of the second thing. Okay, yes, it is an odd of G bar. Okay, coming back to psi, is psi one to one? What would this imply? By the formula for psi, it would imply phi alpha phi inverse equals phi beta phi inverse. <clears throat> what do we want to show? We want to show alpha equals beta. Oh, just left cancel and right cancel? Can we do that? Well, yes, but if you do such a thing, if you cancel the alphas on the left and the alpha inverses on the right, you're not really using the cancellation law from group theory, seemingly, because Alpha and beta are an odd of G, which is a group, but what's phi in? What group is phi in? Phi is not in a group, seemingly. You still can cancel, because effectively you can still compose alpha or phi inverse on the left on both sides, 
and compose phi itself on the right of both sides, and phi and phi inverse are inverse functions, and so yes, they compose to the identity function. It's not quite group theory cancellation, but yes, you can cancel. You could, instead of calling it group theory cancellation, I suppose you could call it function composition, inverse function composition cancellation or something like that. So yes, this proves size one to one. Is it on to, given what? Given something in odd of G bar, maybe call it gamma, gamma in odd of G bar, what element in odd of G gets mapped to it under psi? The, I'm being really careful not to say the wrong things here with my symbols and the words. Given an element of odd of G bar, a automorphism from G bar to itself, what element in odd of G gets mapped to gamma under this function psi. You could do some problem solving. You could essentially set this equal to gamma and solve for alpha. And if you do such a thing, you realize that the element that gets mapped to gamma should be phi inverse gamma phi. It's got to involve, be related to gamma. Wait a minute, is that, is that an element of odd of G? Um, well, look at the picture up here. Work from right to left, you're first applying phi, you're going from G to G bar. Then you're applying gamma, gamma goes from G bar to itself, gamma would be an automorphism of G bar, and then you apply phi inverse, which goes back to G. Uh, technically, you'd want to prove it's one-to-one -one onto an operation preserving, there would be the same argument as over here. By the formula for psi, looking up here and using that, replace alpha with phi inverse gamma phi. Again, phi and phi inverse are not really part of some group, supposedly, but the associative property does work with function composition. I can still do this. Phi composed phi inverse is the identity map of G bar. Maybe I want to call it epsilon G bar. Yeah, and that's it's the same on both sides, I guess, here. And epsilon G bar composed with any automorphism of G bar is that automorphism. This is giving us gamma. Finally is psi OP. Operation preserving. Give me two elements of odd of G. Alpha and beta are both elements of odd G. What's psi of alpha beta? Use the formula for psi again. Get phi, compose alpha beta, compose phi inverse. Okay, that doesn't look like it can really be simplified, but how about if I do this? Psi of alpha times psi of beta? <coughs> well, no. Uh, compose alpha of beta. This is really a, a function composition here. Psi of alpha and psi of beta are both elements of aught of G bar. These are both in aught of G bar. They are both functions. Psi of alpha is a function. Psi of 
beta is a function. Alpha and beta are functions. Psi is a function. Each, each of these things is functions. They're different functions, but they're all functions nonetheless. The first thing is alpha, uh, uh, phi compose alpha compose phi inverse. The second thing is phi compose beta compose phi inverse. Once again, the associated property can be applied. Notice this inner composition here, phi inverse compose phi, is actually different than the composition <coughs> there. That's epsilon g, not epsilon g bar. But it doesn't matter. It still acts as the identity. It still collapses, and you ultimately get the same thing. We have a match. <clears throat> OK? So that proves that psi is operation preserving. It's one-to-one -one onto operation preserving. It is an isomorphism from odd of g to odd of g bar, proving the claim. You like it? You like abstract nonsense? I, I actually kind of like it. I think it's fun. It's certainly confusing. Right? It's abstract nonsense, certainly confusing. But what I try to always emphasize with this stuff is that, yeah, the hard thing is because it's abstract and because of that it's, it's confusing, there's so many symbols, but once you get used to the abstraction, it's actually fairly easy. Dare I say that? Because it's like, well, what else could you do? As long as you understand the concepts clearly, this is all very, quote unquote, natural. And in fact, that's an official name in the subject, official term, naturality. This is not an official definition, but intuitively, naturality is like, in math, is like, well, you do the natural thing. You do the, the only thing that makes sense, and it's like the conclusion just drops out on your lap. My, my, uh, I had a professor, well, the, you, you saw this in my, my world's hardest math class, right, video, where he, he was writing the diagrams all over the board, and I had a hard time with it. It was, it was abstract nonsense, but it was abstract nonsense on steroids. Uh, spectral sequences was the topic. It was just really, really, it was, it was much harder symbolically than this because there were subscripts and superscripts all over the place. And the diagram, the board was full of diagrams, but to him it was all natural, and so it was all trivial. And so he'd look at us and say, "Trivial, right?" And that's the way he talked. Trivial, right? And we we we, we didn't get it. And maybe you still don't believe me when I say this is when you when you get used to the abstraction, it is trivial. And maybe that's even true with spectral sequences, but it takes a long time to get used to spectral sequences. So, uh, and I never did get used to it during the entire semester because he never assigned any homework, but then gave a test at the end. So anyway, he didn't force us to get used to it. Am I forcing you to do this? Well, not the entire thing on an exam, but you should try to think back on this and try to understand it well enough that you could maybe understand reproducing part of it in a con certain context if I describe a certain problem. Maybe I describe what this mapping is and I, I say, explain why it's onto. You know, you'd have to come up with this, this element of out of G to show this is true. Could that, a uh, part of the proof could come up in, a, in the next test, say. <clears throat> 